Great to be here with you. I was asking myself yesterday, like, what percentage of the audience of the Health Optimization Summit gives a shit about saving the NHS? And so now we have the truth. Here it is. So, um, yeah, really great to be here. Very excited. Um, what we're going to talk about today is creating safety in groups. So just to create safety here at the beginning, there's nothing to buy from me. Um, if you want to buy, there's, uh, I'm going to maybe sell you on an idea, but uh, there's nothing to buy. And, you know, I hope that through this time, can, I can share a little bit about what I've learned along the way. So as, as you mentioned here, I grew up in the UK. I have lived in America for the last 17 years. And part of why I had to go to America to go on this journey is because 17 years ago in the UK, you could never have had this conference, right? The number of people who are interested in this kind of thing in the, in the UK 17 years ago was basically zero. Americans are weird. And I just happened to have the American passport. So I went over there to work out what was going on. And um, you know, I'm able to bring some of those ideas, but I, I really do care about saving the NHS. Uh, my mother, who passed away last year, had incredible care for the NHS for years. And, you know, ultimately, when you live in a place like America, it only brings into context how important it is. This social contract that, that exists in the UK is really powerful. The access, um, you know, this, is, this should be a model for... Uh, for the rest of the world, but unfortunately, we have some significant issues that we're going to talk about. So, I did health economics uh, in the UK. I went to the University of Nottingham, and I was there from 2001 to 2003. So, if you look at the cost curve here, this is the cost of spending in the uh, in the UK on the NHS. We were pretty much in like an exponential upward trend, right? So. It's pretty clear to anyone who understands economics that if you're if you're in an exponential upward trend you're gonna have a problem at some point, right? You're gonna run out of money, something's gonna go wrong. Right now, I think it's at, a, we look like at 190 uh, billion this year. So there's a certain point where you just can't fund it, right? Where everyone has a chronic illness. And if you don't have a chronic illness, you're helping someone who does have a chronic illness. And the whole thing just sort of grinds to a halt. Um, and these were the kind of numbers that, that I was looking at. And I basically, I had a psychedelic dream in 2004 um, when I was working for HSBC in Canary Wharf that I was wasting my life. And I need to go and like get into some of this because I grew up in a community, uh, intentional community. And I just had a sort of a moment realizing that my weird upbringing, taking standard process supplements and having chiropractic and, you know, being treated by a homeopath was maybe some sort of solution. I want to go and like follow that thread and 17 years later, here we are. So what is, you know, when I, when I started to, to really understand this, what is driving um, the issues in the NHS? You have the majority of costs are being driven by a range of uh, chronic illnesses that typically have a lifestyle medicine component. Just as a just as a as a test here, has anyone in this room been diagnosed with a chronic illness and made their way back to full health? Right. Um, has anyone seldom used the NHS or any health services because of their own health optimization? All right, so you're already part of saving the NHS in a certain way, in your own small way. But ultimately, if you have an exponential problem, you really need an exponential solution. You can't have a piecemeal solution. And I'll just give you one example. I was speaking to a guy the other day. He said, in, this is in the US. He said, there's been a 400% increase in demand for mental health services during the pandemic. Telemedicine is not going to solve that, right? Telemedicine might make it 20% more efficient. But ultimately, where are all the therapists? Right, you can't just conjure a million therapists out of nowhere, and so the problem is you're going to have you're going to hit a very strong resource constraint, and resource constraint is what economics is all about, and that's why I feel like in a certain way, even though I'm not a doctor, even though I have no medical training, I'm actually in a really good position to solve this problem, and if I've done nothing else over the last 17 years, I've spent more time thinking about how to operationalize health optimization, lifestyle medicine, functional medicine, whatever you want to call it, than, than maybe anyone else in the world. So this is, this is sort of like my jam. But these are the, these are the, like, the major drivers um, of cost. David Cameron, three quarters of healthcare budget goes to long-term chronic conditions. I'm sure uh, most of you guys know this. So what is the state right now? Rapidly rising costs of chronic disease, massive increase in demand for all services, but including mental health services, running out of money, Demand high, supply low. I want to talk about this for a minute. So I guess what I'm known for is I started a thing called the Functional Forum. Um, started in 2014. It became the, the world's largest community and content for doctors who are interested in functional medicine. Um, 
In 2017, we did four of these episodes at the Royal Society of Medicine that Dr. Rangan Chatterjee hosted. And ultimately, you know, my work for, the, I would say, 10 years was helping doctors in the U.S. leave conventional medicine and start to practice health optimization medicine for their patients. That was the plan. The problem with that plan is, although that makes reasonable sense in the US where you could, you know, start hang your shingle and go in that direction, that plan leads to the, the destruction of the NHS, right? If all the good doctors leave and practice on their own and charge cash, that actually is the destruction of the NHS. And given that my mom was like getting care from an oncologist and at the, and at the sort of, um, you know, and, and getting her care from the NHS, those two things, like I just couldn't, uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't have those two things happening simultaneously. And that's why in 2019, I sort of took a moment to really take a, a step back and say, in 14 years, what have I learned? And how could we think differently about applying it into a way that could actually save the NHS, where health optimization wouldn't be a sort of an alternative that people would pay cash for, but would actually be the way that it could be delivered. And in order to do that, you need to think very differently about how to operationalize it, who should be operationalizing it, and how it can pay for, and how palatable it is to decision makers. So, you know, when I say health optimization, I just want to contextualize this, that it's not what's out there right on the floor i'm not talking about that right i don't think supplements can save the nhs i don't think hyperbaric oxygen can save the nhs i do think that groups of people coming together to reverse their chronic illness and groups can and that's what i'm going to take you through right now all right so this is one of my favorite quotes and i think that all of us need to get familiar with this quote because ultimately this is the this is the, the thesis that everything you're going to hear is based on. This is Nikita Valerio says, shouting self-care at people who need community care is how we fail people. Take a photo. Tag me. Everyone loves that one, right? Okay. There you go. All right. There you go. I can't do that all day. I just thought. All right. So here's... The fact of the matter. Chronic disease is biopsychosocial in nature. All chronic diseases are biopsychosocial in nature. And you can't sol solve a biopsychosocial disease with a purely biological intervention. Look at any chronic illness, and there is a biological component to it, right? What is functional medicine? The body breaks down over time. And as the body breaks down over time, symptoms start to arise. And as symptoms start to arise, you know, you call it something and then you treat it, right? That's what functional medicine is, is really understanding the way that the function breaks down over time. And at a certain point, bang, you go past a number. I, don't, I use the American numbers, but your hemoglobin A1C goes over, over seven. Now you've got type two diabetes. Two days ago, you didn't because it was 6.9, right? It's absurd, but that's how, that's how medicine is. We don't really understand that. And the most, most, most patients' frustration with chronic illness is they end up feeling like it's, they're in their mind, it's like healthy, 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 healthy lupus, but it just didn't go down like that. It's just that they weren't paying attention to the symptoms or the doctor was saying, that's not that bad, don't worry about it, right? But that's what's happening. But there are also these psychological and social environmental factors that go in. And you can see, you know, you can see that, you know, in many cases, an environmental insult will lead to a psychological issue that will then turn biological or, you know, there's just like this synergy and you can see these different pieces here. So we must have a biopsychosocial solution, right? We can't just have a purely biological intervention. And I'll show you the data on it in a minute and you'll see how absurd it is that biological interventions are the, first, are, the, are the first line of care. When you look at real data, numbers needed to treat, and you look at the biggest drugs, the most popular drugs, it's absurd that you would start with drugs for lifestyle-driven chronic illnesses. Here's some more stats. So. I think you've probably seen these one. These are both in my book. Uh, you can get it downstairs, but I'm going to give you a free audio because we're going to spread the word here today later, so you don't even have to buy it. But in the book, but there's no, there's no graphics in the in the audio. Um, so look, this is what goes into your health, right? So we do 20% is medical care, 30% is health behaviors, 40% is socioeconomic factors. Again, we're we're not we're not delivering the full 100%. So there's no way that we could do it. This is the most important graph, right? So in 2015, I'm sitting in a conference and it's on human social genomics. And human social genomics is essentially looking at how loneliness affects people at a, at a cellular level. And this, 
this graph here shows you that high social stress, loneliness, is a bigger driver of all-cause mortality than anything else. Smoking, alcohol, physical inactivity, nutrition, all of it. And yet, think of all the money gets spent on public health stuff here, right? And nothing gets spent on this, and it's driving more things. In the book, you'll see all those major chronic conditions that I listed on the first page, all of them exacerbated by loneliness. When you look at people who have cancer, always the people who have the best interconnected social community survive longer than everyone else. It's just the biggest, you know, it's the most obvious. Even like in chronic pain, lonely people have higher pain scores, right? If your only measure of chronic pain is the number of pain between one and 10, which is the NIH validated metric for pain, lonely people have higher pain scores, right? So are we just getting it all wrong by treating people in isolation? So what I've come to learn is that information doesn't move the needle on health. Much as we all like to come to a conference, and much as we all like to learn, you're only gonna remember 5% of this, and then ultimately, you've gotta go off and actually operationalize it in your own life. And that's the, the, the biggest issue that I've had with you know, functional medicine, integrated medicine, lifestyle medicine. There's all these ridiculously big friction points, right? One friction point is the doctor has to be humble enough to realize that they don't have all the tools at their disposal and they need other tools. Then that's level one. Then level two, they have to go out and work out what to do instead, level two. Level three, they have to go back and operationalize it in their practice, level four. And then level five, the patient actually has to operationalize it. The patient actually has to do it and all of those things are ridiculously unlikely and you add them all on one on top of each other that's why you know there's big swathes and why I'm not that excited about the lifestyle medicine movements and those kind of things because ultimately all of those friction points mean that we're going to be waiting too long and the costs are going to go up too much and we're going to run out of money and the whole thing's going to implode and we've got to take action sooner and we've got to work out how to execute it so Let's look at some good news, right? I've got some case studies that are going to blow you away. Dr. David Unwin, 2016 Innovator of the Year, NHS Innovator of the Year. Um, he's annoyed that all of his patients have type 2 diabetes, and he knows that it's reversible with diet and lifestyle, right? Um, but he needs a way to operationalize it in a way that he'll actually be able to do because in the 10-minute visits in the GP, he's not able to do it. So what does he do? He starts a low carb group, right? So they meet every week and essentially he enrolls people into these groups and he runs them every week. And essentially he is, um, you, know, st you know, starting this program. So this is the numbers. And basically over the last few years, you can see what, how many patients, uh, the mean duration of the low carb approach, how long people have been doing it for, the numbers choosing it, the remission rate for people who choose the low carb approach. It's 52% right now, 52% of patients who choose the low carb approach with type 2 diabetes have reversed their diabetes in his clinic. So what does that mean? His spend, this is one disease, one disease type 2 diabetes, one cost structure, which is the cost of the drugs for type 2 diabetes. So if someone has type 2 diabetes, they typically might have three or four other comorbidities. There's drugs associated with that. There's costs associated with that. You know, the reason, you know, if you have someone, your average person, their cost structure goes up like this. They start with like one chronic illness, they start taking drugs, then they have three. If there's no change in the lifestyle, it just goes up and up and up. You multiply that by a whole population and that's how you have an exponential health curve cost of chronic illness, right? So Look at this, he saves 70, six, almost 70,000 pounds over, look at this, this is all the other clinics in the area and they're spending on diabetes drugs. His, his guess, Dr. David Unwin, is his, if you multiplied this by every GP clinic in the country, that's a, saver, a saving of a quarter of a billion pounds, 270 million pounds. One drug category, one chronic illness, that's those savings. Now, the problem is, this happened in 2016. What are we all doing, right? Why hasn't this been rolled out? The truth is, no one gives a shit about type 2 diabetes reversal as much as David Unwin, right? And so the operationalization of it in different clinics is not going to happen. If you're reliant, this is the lesson from this. The lesson is, it's obvious what we should do right? We should treat chronic diseases in groups and have people support each other to reverse their chronic illness, right? Using health optimization structures as the structure. But don't leave the GPs in charge of executing it because we've given them six years with this data and nothing's happened, right? 
So it's good and it's bad, right? Second, Froome, near where I grew up, lovely little place. Been there, lots of old people, right? So Froome, two doctors there decide that they're going to cure loneliness. They recognize the data. They see how obvious it is, how obvious it is that loneliness is driving all cause mortality. So what do they do? They hire five health coaches. They get money from NHS. They hire five health coaches. There's 115,000 people in the Froome and surrounding areas. They have five um, GP clinics. Those five health coaches, half the time they spend in the clinic seeing people who are lonely or have lifestyle deficits. Half the time they spend in these talking cafes, which are just tea shops throughout Froome, and they sit there with this green lanyard on. They recruit 1,500 volunteers in Froome, 1,500 volunteers who also wear the green lanyard, cab drivers, barmen, people who work at the shop. And what do those people all do? What are those people all working towards? They created a database where they got a list of every group that existed in Froome. Lifestyle groups, church groups, sports groups, men's groups, all these groups. There were 2,000 of them. They put it into a website and they created a list of 400 groups where you could show up and you could be welcomed and you could make new friends, right? So that's all they did. And, and, and the job of the 1,500 people is all they do is to push people to that website and say, hey, make some new friends. What are you interested in? Choose one of these things and show up, right? So at a time where in Somerset, emergency room admissions go up. Emergency room admissions are the biggest driver of costs, right? These are the high episode costs of care. If you wanna save the NHS, the best thing that you could probably do is stop people going to the hospital, right? Keeping people healthy and outside the hospital. This is what's happening in those four years, 2013 to 2017. This is what's happening in Froome. So somehow, while this is going up 20%, this is going down, uh, 10, uh, going down 20%, and they save 30 million pounds in a, in a group, just on, just on uh, emergency admissions. So again, like loneliness applied, loneliness medicine applied to a whole population of 115,000 people, extremely valuable um, episode. But what do we learn from this as well? So I'm friends with Julian, and I've had him on my podcast, and we've talked a lot about it. So one, he recognized that if you're going to solve loneliness and you're going to get people into groups anyway, why not upgrade that experience by actually delivering a health curriculum, right? By actually taking them through a process where they do healthy things together, right? Um, and so he came to realize only after doing this, and he, so he realized that uh, was important. And, um, and also, post-pandemic, this is not easy to execute again because everyone in the ecosystem, the coaches, the doctors, the patients, they're all a little bit, there's a little bit of trepidation about getting back and being in community again, right? Being in rooms together, sitting in rooms together. You know, COVID has created a next level level of loneliness. Like I brought out my book, The Community Cure in January, 2020. And two months later, like the loneliness epidemic went from like zero to a hundred. And I'd written about it before and it was the biggest problem before, right? And now you can see it's like exponentially worse. So the third, third case study I want to give is from America, from the Cleveland Clinic. You know, this project has followed me around on the fourth ever episode of the Functional Forum in May 2014. The first time we got the live stream working, Mark Hyman came on the show. I didn't know what he was going to do, and he announced the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. It was the first time that a major mac academic and, and medical center had endorsed functional medicine. And in their model, in the first thing they showed, this was 2019, that chronic disease uh, so that functional medicine outperforms conventional medicine for a whole range of chronic illnesses. And then this year, 2021 in the BMJ, patient outcomes and costs associated with functional medicine care in a shared versus individual setting for patients with chronic conditions, a retrospective cohort study. So if you go and watch this, what you'll see is that if you put everyone into a group first, right? So don't let them see the doctor first, put them in a group that's run by health coaches and physician's assistants. And the physician's assistants are there for many reasons, but the main reason is insurance billing in, in the US. Half the people get better without a doctor. And when I say get better, they go up by five promise score points. Anyone who's done any sort of econometrics and understands this thing, one promise score point is hard to move. Five promise score, score points is pretty much like a complete chronic disease reversal, right? And that's happening in 10 weeks. And all you're doing is getting people into groups, solving loneliness, and then having them implement new healthy behaviors in sleep and in food 
and in stress and and all these different things so this is an example that i want to share with you because this is why i had to go to america because this cool stuff's not happening over here yet okay so what is the future of chronic disease what should we put on the front lines right what should we put on the front lines this is from nature 2015 this is when you really look at the numbers needed to treat for the biggest doctors get out of all or everything else if we learn nothing from the pandemic Lying with statistics is the most obvious thing that health systems do, right? Number needed to treat is the only number that matters, right? For how many people do you give the drug, how many people get better? Abilify, one in five. Nexium, one in 24. Humira, this is $5,000 a month, one in four. Um, look, and these are the biggest, these are the, the top 10 highest grossing drugs in America. It's ridiculous, look at this. One works, this many don't work. This is what drug-based, you know, the front lines looks like. Option two, heal the community. So I've been innovating for the last two years. When the pandemic hit, I realized I knew more about group medicine than anyone maybe on the planet because I've been researching it for this long and interviewing all the different people. So we started building an online group delivery system. These are the outcomes that we see when you deliver a full biopsychosocial experience where people get to meet each other and work together on building health outcomes together. This is what happens right? This is what happens. It's so obvious, so easy. It's so elegant, right? And it's so cost effective. If you have people helping each other, one person helping another person to get healthy is the most valuable thing that's possible because it's beneficial to the person who helps. It's beneficial to the person who gets help and it costs nothing to anyone, right? It's the most valuable resource in medicine. And then you start to see who thinks that we have societal problems that go beyond the problems in medicine, right? The, the, the benefits of groups are amazing for the individual. Self-efficacy, self-regulation of emotions, mindfulness, engagement in life, self-monitoring, health-directed behavior, skill or technique acquisition. All of this stuff is what's needed for people to actually be healthy, to operationalize health in their own lives. But there's benefits interpersonally, empathy, social integration and support, interpersonal learning. Society needs this, friends. It needs this more than anything. And this is just an offset, a free offset of delivering medicine in groups organization. It's efficient, self-care. For the, for the organization of the NHS, efficient care, self-care, timely care, health navigation service. Is any of this valuable to the NHS? Is any of this valuable to England? All of this is possible when you put people in groups. So I want to sort of contextualize it. Well, I've been in America for all this time, and I would say I was looking for a model. What is a model that we could get our head around as sort of like a unifying thesis for how we should think about delivering care. And this is called the therapeutic order. And it was created by two naturopathic doctors. It looks suspiciously like the population health pyramid. And I'm actually talking about that this week on a, on a podcast called Race to Value, which is all about value-based care in America. But essentially what it says is that you should start with the least costly, least invasive interventions first, and then make your way up. So what's at the top of the pyramid? surgery right that's the very last thing drugs second last thing supplements third last thing physical alignments so this is like chiropractic physical therapy self-care restore uh, the, at the very bottom is the basically the social determinants of health stimulation of the self-healing mechanisms is second here so that could be sleep that could be meditation um you know, you're missing the meditation talk next year, but there'll be a course available on Mind Valley that you can buy very soon. Um, and then, so what I recognized is that essentially, if you, if you simplify it, all of these bottom layers, empowerment, doing the modalities and nutrition, all of those can be done in groups and they can be done in the same group. They're not different groups. They just need to be done in groups. And ultimately this became the model because I'm not really that cool with the pyramid. I think the pyramid time is over. It's time for the circle, right? So culture we have to dramatically change the culture we got so many tools available dr rangan chatterjee's podcast i recorded it this week it's a two-hour version of this talk it comes out in july you know that guy is changing the culture in a certain way 1.6 million downloads he was on the bbc he's got this amazon podcast like he's doing his best effort to change the culture of health in america community is the next least costly this is you know freed basically at point of of delivery changing the culture through content community the next thing closest to free. Coaching is a critical role. We need to start taking better advantage of coaches. Why coaches? Why coaches? What is a coach? The person that is missing from healthcare 
is the Alcoholics Anonymous sponsor, right? The person who has got sober, right? The person, all of you, the people who put their hands up at the beginning, when you got sober, when you reversed your chronic illness, right? You became exponentially valuable to a whole group of other people. And some of you are delivering that value. You've stepped into it. You are a health professional or a celebrity or something, and you're putting out the content. You're helping, even helping other people in your community one by one, other people that you know. It's extremely valuable, but coaching is this missing layer, and there's this army of people that have you know, been the first generation of people who reversed their chronic illness that need to be uh, let loose on the rest of the population in a structure um, that can combine. And then care, that's the medical care, and then some sort of cost sharing, that's the NHS. All right, so I promised you something awesome. If you wanna to listen to my book, it's three hours, you can download it here for free. You can go and buy it outside, but I don't think I get any money from that. So just listen to it. Thecommunitycure.com slash audiobook, The Smooth Sounds of James Maskell. You can listen to it on your way home. If your ears have more free time than your eyes, download the audio book, listen to it, share it. I don't care. I kept the audio right so that everyone could distribute it for free. Thecommunitycure.com slash audiobook. Right, so what have I been doing? I, for the last, so I, did, I gave a talk called The Community Cure for the NHS in December 2019. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, it was one of my functional forums. We did it with our functional medicine community group in Birmingham. And the plan is still the same, right? The plan is still the same. But what I came to realize is we can't leave it to the GPs to operationalize this, right? That, you know, that it's gonna be hit or miss. No one cares as much as Unwin about type two diabetes reversal. The GPs have got enough going on. So I, in the last week, my goal in being here in, in the UK for the last week, and this is my last day, I'm going home. But this was for me, and I'm, I haven't said this really publicly, but I'm giving myself three years to really do something significant here in this country. And this is sort of like the kickoff of that program, going into Rongan's podcast and having lots of interesting meetings with NHSX, NHS Innovation. Um, when we started the pandemic, I wanted to see, is it possible to run these groups online? Are there gonna be secondary benefits of running them online that you wouldn't expect? Just like there were secondary benefits of telemedicine that you wouldn't expect until you actually started doing it. And so, um, we're using health coaches and this is what I was saying. One day you will tell your story of how you overcame what you went through and it will be someone else's survival guide. It's a beautiful quote from Brene Brown and that is the foundation of what I think we can do together. People get as much value from each other as they do from the coach. This is what we've seen. So I guess there's a few things I want to just, just wrap up here because we're finishing. So my plan, we have created a virtual group delivery system, groups as a service. It's software as a service, so it's SaaS, plus we hire and train the coaches, right, for the system. In, in America, think of it as prescription strength AA, right? So doctors can prescribe it, they can recommend it to their patients, but ultimately it's all being operationalized inside a digital technology that takes patients in, takes them through a six month program, and you know, assigns them a coach, assigns them a progress partner, and all of that is automated. My, that's my, my plan for the next little while is to sell that here so that doctors can have like a, a sort of an extra layer of care. It can either be delivered at the highest level or it can be delivered via GPs, where essentially doctors can have a completely scalable group delivery system for let's say the 10 most co costly chronic illnesses. So that's what I'm gonna do. But what I want all of you guys to think about is how all of you, th there's only 2,000 people at the summit, there's 57 million people in the country, right? There is so much amazing content out there on how to be healthy. You're listening to some of it this weekend. My challenge to all of you is in the meantime, while I'm making my steps through, and if, if anyone in here has any ways that they think that they could deploy, I've met awesome doctors this week all the way through. I'd love to you know, talk, talk, talk with you about it. But in the meantime, all of us in this room can be an agent of dissemination, community, and connection. I would challenge all of you to lead in your local communities. There are so many ways for us to create structures where, you know, where groups of people can come together, where content can be shared. Think about something as simple as a healthy book club, right? Meeting once a month with a group of people, reading a book, coming together and talking about it and talking about how you're actualizing it. That is something that you could do, that anyone could do. You could lead it. You could put up um, a thing on, on Meetup or 
Facebook or wherever you would bring people locally. When I go to other groups, I say you could join one of those. But I want to challenge everyone in this conference to lead those because what we need is leadership. We need people who are going to bring people together and I would challenge all of you to do it. So the question is, can health optimization save the NHS? In my estimation, it is the only thing that can save the NHS. If you have a high proportion of the country with costly chronic illnesses, there's only one way that the cost curve goes and ultimately that leads to the destruction. In my lifetime, I've got two daughters. I hope they're not gonna be American. I wanna bring them back. They've got American accents, it's annoying. Um, but, but at some point, I'm hoping to live here again and I can't, you know, I can't have that. And so it's gonna take all of us to, to work together. So at Heal Community, we're reversing chronic illness together. But I think that um, you know, all of us can play a part in solving loneliness, creating structures where people can actually do healthy behaviors and transform uh, health outcomes in the UK. Thank you very much. All right, any questions? Mike person left, yeah. Yeah. I think I read 15 this morning, but I think that might be a little bit low. Um, yeah. I think I, I, should, I was walking around the downstairs and I think I read 15. We've got time for a couple. Of couple questions, couple of go on, yeah. Questions. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Any other questions, yeah. Hi, <laughs> first of all, thank you for this talk. It was amazing. I have more of a statement than a question, but uh, I know it's because I'm a practitioner as well. And I know it's um, this disconnection and this lack of communities a lot more uh, prevalent in like Western communities. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at, you know, Africa, Asia, there's a very strong community yeah. sense. So I think that's also why, like, if you look at the root cause, I think it's really a disconnect from nature, this yep. whole lack of community. But I think, yeah, definitely that's why there's so many people dealing with so many chronic conditions in quote unquote the developed world yeah. where you have more resources. But yeah, there's a very big disconnect. Absolutely, I mean, I agree. If in the book, I just talk about it's technology. At every level, it's technology, right? When you can commute, suddenly you live in the suburbs in single family homes. You're not next to each other. That's one technology. Now, you know, you can source everything you need from strangers. You never have to leave your house. If you learned anything in the pandemic, it was that, right? You can get Uber and Amazon and everyone just like comes to your house and you have all these strangers that you only meet once that are doing all those things. And that is the destruction of the fabric of society. And I would just say, we have to rebuild it somehow. The reason why we rebuild it in medicine is that there's already budget assigned for it, right? The NHS has the budget to execute these groups. The cost of running these groups, 20 people at a time, 20 coaches, a, a coach could take 20 groups and 20 people per group. It's so efficient, right, compared to any other sort of medicine because ultimately, and I was talking to a GP the other day, imagine if rather than having that same patient who comes in every month for their prescription and basically to talk to you because they're lonely, what if you could put them into this group and you wouldn't hear from them for six months and hopefully not for a much longer because the weight of behavior change has been put onto that group, right? That is where the, the, the support of that group is happening. So yeah, I completely agree, yeah. One more question. Oh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I, I introduced myself earlier, I'm a yeah. GP, and I actually tried to set up group consultations at my NHS GP surgery, yes. but I was met with lots of resistance. Totally. So there's just so much resistance within the medical community and also within the public. They just don't understand the value of groups because yeah. I've even tried to do it in my own private practice recently, set up group consultations, and everyone's like, no, I don't want to be in a group. Yeah. So how can we change that, the mindset of absolutely the leaders and also the public i would general. say that's a, such a good point you know we found that no one wants to be in a group until they experience a group and then realize that the group is awesome right the first thing that happens in any of our groups people are there on zoom if you can imagine you guys have all been on a million zoom calls how, how many in the first session of the first zoom how many how many cameras do you think are on by what percentage like 20 percent right? people are like i don't know what this is i don't know what i signed up for seems weird right what is the first thing that happens in the first group? The health coach who's running the group, well, first of all, the doctor will like introduce the health coach to pass their authority onto this other person, right? Say this is an important person. The first thing that the coach does, share their story of how they reverse their chronic illness, how bad it was, how lonely it was, how isolating it was, how annoying it is, how painful it is. And then I started to take these steps. I got a little better. I moved along a bit and I got better. And what you see? Bing, 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 bing. The cameras turn on because people feel safe. 
right? People feel safe in those groups. So in the book, I do talk about ways in which, you know, there are some clinics in America. The, the reason why I went to America is there's a lot of innovation. You don't have this kind of resistance, right? There's a lot, there's a lot of, um, there's just an exception, a, a, an acceptance of innovation. So in the book, there are a number of things I talk about. One of the things that was really effective is um, there, was a, there was a clinic that used to do all of their patient onboarding, right, one by one. So they would, or they would do, they would do a group, right? So they would say, they would say, okay, if you want to become a new patient of this clinic, you have to show up Friday at one o'clock. Which Friday can you make it? And then you have to do this one hour lecture that we're going to give you because they realized it was way more efficient. So at the beginning, they just gave a one hour lecture. This is what natural, you know, functional medicine is. This is what you're going to have to do. This is what I'm going to do. And it worked okay. And then they realized what they did is they stopped the doctor doing it. They had the front desk person doing it. And she did the same lecture. And it was better because people felt actually this was a little bit more approachable. And then the, the genius thing that they did, they changed it to 20 minutes. They did 20 minutes of talk. And then they just had everyone like share what was going on for them. And it introduced them to group medicine. And, and people saw for the first time, privacy is the weirdest thing, right? Privacy is when we talked about this on Rongan's podcast, a two hour podcast, there's a lot of time to get into it. You know, is privacy serving us in healthcare? Like does privacy really help? Like what is the value of privacy? I understand the Hippocratic Oath and I get it. But in that moment, what happened is for the first time, if you're trying to get off your chronic pain medication, if you're trying to get off any medication, you've never met anyone who's trying to do that. And when you meet a group of other people who are sick and are like now ready to try something else, that moment sends a signal of safety to your nervous system that's so powerful that you actually say, hang on a minute, this is cool. Like I want to be part of this. So there is a lot of work to be done in the zero to one, but I actually think that's where GPs can be the most effective because you still have that 10 minutes. What can you do in that 10 minutes? Overcome some of those objections for patients, prescribe the group, use your authority to take these people from zero to one, but don't, you know, you don't have to operationalize it. You're too important. You know, you have too much training, too much has been invested in the GP to have them operationalize and sit there in the groups. And in my experience, the doctors are actually not that good at it because you have been valued your whole career for your expertise. And what you don't need in a group is an expert. What you need is a facilitator. And those skills are literally diametrically opposite. And if you look at Jeff Geller and Shilpa Saxena and all these kind of people that have gone through the journey to become expert facilitators, having been doctors, ego death is basically what they have to go through. I'm not waiting for ego death in the NHS GP population. We're going to do this now. We're going to operationalize it with coaches. We're going to save the NHS. We're out. Thank you.